So hello everybody, let me welcome here Michal Suchanek uh, and he, we should be discussing stuff around K-Build in this session. So welcome Michal and the floor is yours. Okay, so you can see the relevant websites uh, uh, for the kernel build system. We have a GitLab repository with uh, some of these scripts. Some of these scripts are included uh, directly in the kernel source repository. Uh, there is the kernel CVS website, which probably most of you know. And there is also the kernel susecom website, which is produced by KBuild and which uh, like uh, exports our kernel sources uh, uh, to the uh, to the general public. Uh, I have two topics that uh, we might want to talk about. Uh, one is uh, management of embargoed patches. We did some changes to this, but there is uh, uh, there is possibly more that can be done. And another thing is uh, the handling on of sorted patches. And of course, this is a discussion. You can also bring uh, more topics if you have some. Regarding the embargoed patches, uh, uh, VM uh, uh, Petter implemented some uh, check. Uh, uh, Petter, together with Tony, implemented some checks uh, which prevent embargoed patches uh, uh, leaving the cable system, but uh, there is still problem with the handling of these patches. People often merge them to the, uh, to the public branch by mistake. And um, I think that uh, we had some pull request that marks the CVA branches uh, as public when they are merged into public branches. And uh, there is uh, the problem that for many branches, uh, the separate embargo branch doesn't, uh, doesn't exist. So maybe this can be changed, especially for the CV branches. So essentially, you propose to generate always like the embargoed patch, uh, embargoed branch for each for each CVE branch, yeah, so that it already exists from the beginning, basically. Uh, that, that's not a problem of uh, existing from the from the beginning or having it created. We don't have it for many branches at all. And that, uh, that causes problems because some maintainers are used to uh, this uh, handling of a separate branch, some, some aren't. And uh, uh, we had embargoed, brand, uh, embargoed patches merged into the RT branches, embargoed uh, patches merged into the, C into the CVE branches, which then were man merged, uh, merged automatically by cable into the public branches and so on. And didn't we create some infrastructure to actually check that the CVE reference doesn't like reference already patch that, should, that is still embargoed or issue that is still embargoed like i had a, like yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's what i talked uh, about before that uh, we had checks uh, that we have <laughs> checks uh, uh, implemented uh, that ensure that the embargoed branch uh, the embargoed patches don't leave the cable infrastructure mm -hmm. but uh, uh, we maybe could change the workflow so that uh, they don't uh, get merged into the wrong branch in the first place. Well, obviously, it would be better. <laughs> yeah. Um. 
I think there is there are two things that the developer didn't know that or it's wrongly recognized that bug is embargoed and put in the public branch. And in that case, um, well, even if we have a different branch name or a different dedicated branch, it doesn't help because he or she believes that it's the right one, no? Uh, yes, uh, it can be that the patch is uh, not recognized correctly as embargoed, but that's not something we can do, uh, we can fix uh, in uh, KBuild, and it's actually pretty rare. Uh, the more common problem is that people don't know where to bring, uh, when to uh, where to put the embargoed patches and where to merge them, or there is uh, automation that merges uh, the CVA branch which has uh, the embargoed patch because it doesn't have a, an embargo branch corresponding to the CVA branch and stuff like that. Yeah. Yes. So I, yeah, we have already embargo branch no so not for cv branches as far as i know um yeah right that's that's simply because we didn't <laughs> take that but in technically just switch branch off the embargo branch for cv right or is there any obstacle to do that um. There probably isn't. People just uh, uh, need to know that uh, they should request it if it uh, doesn't exist, or we can create it in mass, and then people have to know that uh, this exists and they should use it. Yeah, I guess so. That, that's another case. <laughs> just just do it and just let's let's use that. I I am afraid that the only reason was the um, CV branch has um, so that directory thrash between that so that somehow a little bit confusing but other than that i guess there should be no problem in the workflow yeah so i'm for that creating the embargo branch for cbev uh, uh, i also think that creating the creating uh, CV uh, embargo branches for CV would make pretty good sense uh, because uh, usually when you have an upcoming up, upcoming update, you don't have only embargoed CV patches, but also also some unembargoed regular CV patches. And once an embargoed patch gets into the CV branch. That would essentially block it from being merged into the target branches, target SLE branches. And you would have to think of other ways to get all those non embargoed patches into the, the regular branch. So I think for consistency, making CV embargo branches makes pretty good sense. at least for those that are uh, merged into active products. I'm not sure that uh, it makes sense for CV Linux 2.6. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, 2.6.32, well, yes, that's only used for Teradata now, so that's probably would be an exception. Yeah, but maybe it's better to have both also for consistency. Yeah. Otherwise, also have that make exception makes things uh, confusing <laughs> again. Uh, yeah, definitely. The more exceptions and the more things to uh, think about, uh, I think it would be much easier to have everything consistent for all CV branches and not having to think that, okay, uh, 2632 is different. And so yes, these I, I, I... Yep. sorry, go Michael. 
No, thank you. So, um, yeah, one thing is not really clear to me. So, uh, you're saying that we should create those embargo branches uh, for CV branches, uh, but um, how does that help with the situation that people simply send pull requests without embargo? So, I, as a maintainer of the CVE branch, do not know that uh, I should be merging into the embargo branch. So, uh, um, who are we actually targeting? Uh, um, maybe the key question for now, because I'm not sure everyone is aware, and I'm definitely not. At what moment exactly now the check uh, takes place? Uh, the check uh, takes place uh, when people submit for next branch and when the branch is uh, about uh, to be pushed uh, into OBS or into the uh, um, outside uh, mirror of the kernel tree. Yeah, yeah. so uh, it does not prevent the for next from being pushed to current CVS, or it does, but only uh, when it's for next against the SLE branch, which is mirrored outside. Uh, it should prevent when it's uh, for next branch, uh, and it's not uh, for an embargoed branch. Um, there is also the Git hook that can be used for the pre uh, push or which which push <laughs> I prepare that and the branch maintenance can apply that the git hook for that so that and they don't push the stuff um the, I forgot is that uh... so technically uh now you shouldn't be able to push uh uh, an embargoed fix to your for next branch for a CDE branch, a CDE branch because uh, it's not uh, an embargo branch, and if the fix, uh, if the embargo CDE, uh, the CDE fix is embargoed, it shouldn't be possible to push it there. So there's a server side hook. Yes. Um, so uh, first thing, uh, I think it hasn't been tested on a CVE branch, uh, but uh, what Michal says is is correct. I don't see a reason why it shouldn't be blocked. And yes, it's tested server side. Uh, this might be confusing because Takashi originally wrote a, a pre-commit script that also checks against the same uh, embargoed API. And some people do have that in their local copies. But it's enforced on the server, actually. For everybody, not just the uh, maintainers. Right. Yes. Michal Patrick is asking in the chat whether the patch we are talk uh, whether the check we are talking about is and some link to GitLab. So maybe if you can, <laughs> if someone can tell, either you or Petit Sashik. Yeah, it sounds like uh, the, the script that does the checking, or at least part of the solution. Yes, there's uh, the comment that, OK, yeah. Um, no, so is the Python module that implements it, right? 
actually yeah because it's this hooks python check embargo yes the, the, that that's um yeah right And Takashi has uh, written into the chat that there is a local git hook and scripts check embargoed bugs. You can deploy that on any local clone of the of the of current CVS. I actually recommend you do because then you get the the check early. But we are not uh, like it's it's not a replacement for the server side check. And see, we have um, the the late check when pushing into a public repo uh, is should not be necessarily strictly speaking uh, so this if it triggers then it um, means that we we made an, a mistake so this is kind of an insurance and um, also can do we have any check around the mirroring to so exporting to the on OBS and that. So usually we when we push so submit the branch, it will be not exported to outside immediately, but only after once per day or so. And we can also have a check for the embargo things at the mirroring. You mean the mirroring to GitHub or the, mirror, uh, the upload into OBS? Yeah, in both cases. It's implemented in both cases. That's what I'm saying, uh, that, what I'm talking about. Debut. Okay, that's, so that's, that's okay, that's yeah. done in the mirroring, not in the, for the IBS for next, okay. Yes, um, so first, um, okay, we probably need more uh, more documentation on how this process actually works because it's not mirrored once a day or twice a day. It's mirrored every, hour i think uh but with a two hour delay which means um yeah you have some time to correct and fix things and you always have two hours to fix things or more like uh, at, at a minimum two hours uh, if you happen to push just after uh, a mirroring uh, round has been scheduled then you have slightly more. Uh, you mean about the mirroring to the GitHub or to the OBS? Both. Both, both are for two hours. Okay. I thought it's uh, less often. <laughs> well, the OBS no, it's not that often. Okay, Michal, you explain. The OBS mirroring, well, we have two instances of OBS and the uh, external OBS, the mirroring happens once a day, sometime in the morning and has this two hour delay. And uh, the IBS mirroring, the, uh, it happens all the time and uh, there isn't a delay, like intentional <laughs> delay. <laughs> So the IBS, IBS should be fine. It's about OBS, right? In that case, in that case for embargo. Yes. Things. And the few times that we encountered the problem about the, this embargo leak, uh, so the lesson learned was also how to, yeah, so <clears throat> take things away. Uh, so contacting the GitHub and so on. So I forgot that what, what took so long time, actually it was difficulty. OBS was, and um, actually it was not easy to, so scratch the things completely, if I remember correctly. It, it can still keep somehow or indeed uh, so um obs uh, stores uh, each submission like each commit uh they do not have, okay let's each time you upload to the obs uh the new state is stored forever in history 
So if you know that there was an embargoed patch in one of the states, then you can always retrieve it. Uh, purging that needs coordination from the build team. Uh, and they have to do that somehow manually in on the storage. I don't think there's an API. Uh, for GitHub, that's a similar story. Uh, you may uh, you may move uh, the the branch head, uh, but the corresponding Git objects are still accessible through the public API. If you know the hash, that's actually more difficult. Uh, but we, yeah, we, we, we always want to purge all traces. That means we have to contact uh, GitHub staff to uh, completely purge the comments from the repository. Well, to purge the, uh, uh, the patch from OBS, I deleted the kernel package. So it was recreated as a fresh package, and then the link to the data is lost from view. Uh, and I'm not sure if you can retrieve it in some way from OBS after that, probably. OK, if you know the source hash, uh, that's the long hash in uh, OSC log, uh, then you can. I think they clean it up periodically, but not immediately. OK. Is that all? Uh, I mean, there is one more thing about embargoed patches that we may have to discuss. And I think we may have to discuss that with the cybersecurity team rather than in this round. But I want to raise some awareness. I was asked uh, last year uh, for services that might in the future be moved into the data center, into the colocation DC, I mean. And I, th I identified that in theory, uh, these cable workers, uh, which perform the test builds, uh, could be moved into the colo DC because they, they are productive uh, servers. Um, Obviously, this opens up the question, OK, are we allowed to store embargoed patches in the colocation DC? So far, I don't have the answer, but I'm just giving a heads up. Uh, we'll have to revisit that. <clears throat> what is the source of the uh, the, the list of bugs that the the scripts use I, I see something in the python about smash list but yes uh, this is a smash api provided by the maintenance team and it's like a live query of bugzilla or it's, it's some caching that can be stale or it can okay it shouldn't be stale uh, but it is cached uh, they expect that the AP, that the url can be uh, retrieved uh, quite often and i think they refresh the cache with each change to the embargoed state the embargo state is not stored in bugzilla that's stored in smash internally And who has access to that if I need to ask for some correction? Marcus? Marcus Meissner definitely is your contact. The security team in general, they have a mailing list, security at suzy.de. OK. They probably also have a Slack channel.
So if there are no more questions, maybe we can move to batch sorting. So maybe one, one last question to the embargoed patches. So, so the idea is then that basically the CVE embargoed branches would be auto merged to the product embargoed branches and then, or how actually would the workflow look like? I think it needs to be merged manually because the embargoed branches are most of the time outdated. I see. Yeah, we probably don't want auto merges because often you do some submission and then there needs to be another submission that takes only you want to do minimal changes, just take some urgent fix and or another CV and automatic merging could get in the way of that. Yeah, so I'm asking mainly from a developer point of view. So if I have an embargoed page and it needs to go to several product branches feeding from the same CVE branch. So would it then be enough to push it just to the embargo CVE branch and then the branch maintainers are expected to pull from the embargo CVE branch? Well, That's what... uh, yeah, it's an interesting question how to make them know because there's no yeah, exactly <laughs> <laughs> like usually for the embargo stuff you know the, these are reasonably high profile issues so so like maintainers are probably checking they have the fix but but yeah still it's better sh they should be notified somehow that there is actually something in the embargo the bench they should pick so uh, maybe yeah. the email automation could do that yeah, and that that can be um, that information can be provided by the, for example, kernel security sentinel. That say they do um, <clears throat> and that first to assign or throw something, and they can mention that that's the CV, uh, the embargo things that's that's to the embargo branches to be pushed. And nowadays, then um, maintenance security team on this up that affected um, branches at first and at the moment then we can put the note that and so it should be it should go cv linux 53 embargo branch and so i suppose uh, this could be scripted because uh, it should be possible to write a script that would check that the embargo branch, uh, that the patch is added by the embargo branch, which are not merged into the main branch, uh, no are no longer embargoed. Not all of uh, all of them are not embargoed anymore, and warn the maintainer that it should be merged back. And th that's not nothing that would uh, be really time critical. So it could be a script that would be run say once a week or so uh, because we only want to prevent completely forgetting to merge the embargo branch back yeah right you but um, if, if we have a let's say cv embargo branch and it will contain pull requests for different uh, embargo uh, box uh, uh, lifetime of those embargoes can differ really a lot. So uh, how do we do the mer merging then when, let's say, we uh, have some of those that uh, embargo has been lifted while others not, while they still oh. might be historically in uh, merged um, uh, the way that the merging wouldn't be possible? Well, I, I don't say the merge should be automatic. Uh, I suggested that there should be some script that would check that uh, uh, the need to keep the embargo branch with outstanding patches uh, no longer uh, is no longer there, and warn the maintainer that uh, the embargo branch should be merged back. But 
that should be manual. Um, I think it can be even automat automated. So suppose uh, there are two bug fixes in the CVE branch, and only one is <coughs> um, still, one is uh, public, and one another is still in bug gauge. But in that case, um, the product branch has already merged something, and that was public. Then you can at first the public the product branch to the uh, no, the embargo branch to the public branch, and yeah, that's I think simply um, that's the case. So at the public uh, no, I mean the product branch, the slave branch can merge basically merges from both product embargo and also CVE. CB also CB embargo. So there are three sources and simply the auto, auto, um the K build can merge what it can merge now. <laughs> so that would I think that would work. Well, I guess we could also do um, auto merge, but uh, it's not really necessary. I think the main point what we want to prevent is completely forgetting to merge back so well it doesn't happen that often of course only say once in month or few months so okay whether we do an auto, an auto merge if possible or leave that to the branch maintainer to merge manually i don't think that's so important to distinguish and you don't really need three sources because if you merge a CV embargo into CV branch, then it gets merged uh, uh, from the CV branch to the product branch. Well, in the in the ideal case, when everything is done via merge rather than cherry pick, then it's not really a big issue. Uh, there will be only the commit will be there only once. Uh, there will be two or three different uh, paths in the graph, but that doesn't really do that much harm or confusion. Okay, so I think we can move to the pet sorting because there are like 10 minutes left in this session or 11 actually at this point, but yeah. Yeah, there are some problems with the pet sorting. Uh, probably the, uh, uh, like, uh, most prevalent problem is that uh, uh, some upstream branch, uh, some upstream maintainers rebase their uh, branches, and then the laws uh, lose the state, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sorted section is no longer sorted, and uh, it's not possible to. Uh, uh, merge new sorted patches without uh, taking some action and there is a question if uh, perhaps the uh, sorting uh, tools could handle this uh, in a better way mm. 
Uh, I think the biggest problem here is if we are actually able to uh, script uh, the update of the commit IDs or in general the upstream references, uh, which is not re really trivial. I had some script, but uh, that could handle to some extent the simple cases, but uh, it's not really something I would like to use in the wide because it was essentially uh, doing the trick using git range diff and seeing what does it look like or what does the output look like. So it's a very crude way and a very fragile way to do that. Well, if I remember correctly so far, the solution or not really solution was uh, to keep uh, the, repo the maintainer repositories, which were known to do rebase frequently, out of the sorted section. But yes, uh, yes. we don't know all of them, and there are always all, also some repositories which do not do that regularly, but still do from time to time. So it's and it's definitely not perfect because you still need to update the references, even if it does not block the sorted section at the moment. Oliver, I guess, yeah. Yeah, just Oliver had a note. Uh, I can see he has raised his hand as well, but he has not joined with the microphone, so I don't think Oliver you will be able to tell anything. <laughs> but he proposed that he would like to move to a system where basically there is only the Linux repository and the rest goes into the unsorted section. So basically, we will get rid of all the per maintainer sections, if I understand right. Yeah, that would make uh, the sorted section way less usable because uh, uh, I think that uh, the ability to sort the patches before they are merged uh, to the Linux story is important feature and it's used a lot. Uh, I agree, and there are uh, many uh, frequently used maintainer repositories which do behave well and do not rebase. I don't remember, for example, the net and next trees to ever do a rebase in something like 10 years. So, and probably more. So, taking everything out is probably would really do more harm than good. I think the um, script sequence patch works usually because uh, we, if you don't insert any new patches by yourself, that's that's easy in the subsystem tree. Because um, um, sequence patch itself, uh, as a sort patch, sorts only the main mainline patches and data persistence. But the breakage happens in only in some uncertain subsystem tree. And if we have some um, the tool improved for only concentrating concentrating on the certain subsystem, uh, sorting only one subsystem, then I think that makes people happy. So if we, if you, if we want to um, um, uh, sort the subsystem tree, then you can do that, even if other sub subsystem trees are broken. Yes, the problem is the problem is that how the sorting is implemented or the sorted check is implemented, that it takes the section, does the sorting again uh, from scratch, and compares the result with the current sorted section. And if it's different, it says that it's not sorted. 
and that means that it needs to sort even the uh, the broken trees or it needs to grow code uh, to skip the trees that are broken and just keep them in the existing order which it doesn't have uh, i i'm not really sure but i think even the series insert does fail if we have uh, patches with uh, commits which are no longer uh, correct yeah, it's the same code. I, if I remember correctly, the only thing that actually works is the uh, main uh, series sort script when I run without the shoe. Uh, does it also help if you don't have the branches in your Git tree that are broken because then it ignores them because it, he has no, it has no information about them. Well, I think that, uh, Oliver, I think that it was explained already what it buys us. So I don't understand what uh, uh, your question. It's useful to, to be able to sort patches that are not yet in the uh, industry. Yeah, so if we have the 100 more patches that are still outside the industry, and if we manage that, if we want to manage so many patches, then it can be still useful. That I can understand that too. But it's useful for certain persons that who, uh, yeah, so, but if that breaks, that's a problem, yeah. We can't hear you, Oliver. You have listen only mode. You can leave the room and then enter again and just select that you want to join with the microphone. Yeah. Now you're muted. In now? Yeah. Yes. The problem with that system is that it is extremely clunky. We write repositories into the very scripts. And it is useful, yes, to some people. Uh, that's a minority. I'm sorry, but the, the kernel CVS has to work. There is a very good reason to keep it as simple as possible. And that very much means remove everything but the Linus tree out of sort if, if, if you want to sort patches by hand, you are not prevented from that. Yeah, but, I'm sorry, but as soon as the patches are merged into the Linus tree, they have to be resorted anyway. No, they don't have to be resorted. They are already in the order in which they were merged in the maintainer branch, and they don't yes. change the order. And that's With the key point, because these branches in the are merged through a tree that, that is relevant for the changes that they implement. Yeah, but they are no, only relevant, only ordered with respect to themselves, not to the rest. Because you cannot predict the order of merging. Yes, that's but, not a problem. But it's no use either. Well, uh, it does not happen that uh, they would need reordering uh, with respect to patches which are already mainline. Everything that's after the mainline part will stay after what is now in the mainline part. And it's of a lot. Uh, it is very much of use if you get a bunch of uh, patches from uh, a maintainer branch that uh, the scripts can ma uh, put them in the series conf in the right order so that they apply automatically. You don't have to do that by hand. Yeah, 
And at the moment of merge to the mainline, you do not actually have to do anything because next run of series sort will update the references and will move the patches to the right place, uh, handle the subheaders, the comments of the subsections. So that saves a lot of work, which to be honest, in the past was often forgotten. Yeah, if you look at some of the older branches from the times before series sort, uh, you will still find a lot of patches which have been merged into mainline years ago, but are still marked as uh, in maintainer three or similar. That does not happen anymore. Okay, then I would propose that we really make this cleanly. Then there should not be one sorted section, but there should be as many sorted sections as there are repos they refer to. But they are. Yeah, but they are not independent. Well, uh, okay. Uh, I guess the key problem is something slightly different. Whether it will be one section or many small sections, it does not really matter. What does matter is whether we are able to modify the scripts in such way that the regular work workflow would not be blocked if one of the maintenance repositories get rebased, gets rebased. Yes. And, well, I cannot really answer that question, but uh, that's the important question, not whether there will be one sorted section or multiple yes. sorted section. Yeah. The important question is, are we able to change the scripting in such a way that rebasing one of the maintenance repositories would not block the regular workflow. Okay, guys, we are out of time, so I'm afraid we will not solve this in this session. Uh, I will just remind Michal Hotko has written uh, in the chat that he would like to continue the embargo branch topic on the mailing list, so that's probably so someone has to fire, uh, start the thread. I guess Michal would be willing to take that if he wants to continue the discussion, but yeah, just that you are aware. Uh, thanks everybody for joining.